okay well <clears throat> um hello everyone good afternoon just afternoon um i'm <clears throat> chairing this um fringe meeting um which is as everyone knows from the humanist and uh, secularist liberal democrats um toby kens the chair of the um hsld is uh on the call and uh, so is stuart huntley uh, we have um two um, platform speakers, if platform speakers is uh, what you call them. Uh, Cathy Riddick, uh, who is the coordinator of the Wales uh, Humanists. She's, uh, Cathy is a management consultant by profession. I think that sort of sums it up, Cathy, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and she is um, going to speak first. Uh, she has been involved in using the Human Rights Act to um, achieve educational reform in Wales, in particular from the point of view of the society, ensuring that uh, non-religious belief is included in the uh, new religion, values and ethics uh, curriculum. Uh, the meeting is about the Human Rights Act and is principally concerned with considering how the uh, government's proposals to replace the Human Rights Act with um, an updated, they say, Bill of Rights uh, will affect and threaten the operation of the Human Rights Act um, in the UK, which most of us think has been extremely successful. The government abandoned the commitment that it once made to effectively take us out of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, and they say that they will remain loyal to all those rights while adding others. But they also say that they will increase the supremacy of the Supreme Court. And there's a consultation, as many of you will know, going on at the moment. Uh, and our party's position uh, is and has been that the Human Rights Act is a, a landmark piece of, piece of human rights legislation that we want to stick with. But um, we need to look at the threat. We need to look at how it uh, will operate. Uh, and that's the purpose of this meeting to discuss it. Our second uh, speaker will be David Wolfe, who's a public law uh, barrister specializing in uh, human rights, in environmental law and um, public law. Uh, he uh, worked with Cathy uh, on the case that uh, she took. He's worked with Humanists UK on a number of cases. Uh, and is going to uh, speak second. So I think the, the format of the meeting will be that um, we'll have our two speakers uh, first, speaking for around 10 minutes each, and then we will move into a combination of a question and answer and discussion session. Uh, Toby will uh, introduce the questions uh, and we'll uh, hope that we generate a discussion uh, around um, the virtual room. But uh, if I could now ask uh, Cathy to open the batting for us as our first speaker. Cathy. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really hoping David does get to join us. I think he's having some technical difficulties at the moment. Um, but as he is the expert in this area and I have no legal expertise at all, um, his contribution will be really valuable. Um, so as Jonathan said, I'm the coordinator for Wales Humanists. Um, I'm also a board member of the RE Council of England and Wales. I sit on uh, WASACRE, which is the Welsh Association of SACRES, um, and I'm a school governor um, and a parent. And it was my that last role as a parent back in 2016, uh, when my eldest child started in primary school, that made me question how RE was being taught in Wales because he was coming home with some really interesting stories um, from, from school time, uh, which he was telling to me as factual stories. Um, so I realised a way that I could get become involved in this was to apply to join my local SACRE. And these standing advisory councils on religious education was something I hadn't come across before. Um, but I wrote to my uh, local council, the Vale of Glamorgan, and asked if I could become a member of the SACRE uh, representing humanist beliefs. And the, um, the original response from them was, what is a SACRE? Which was quite interesting, bearing in mind it's one of their bodies. So when I pointed them to their own webpage, 
um, they took my request to the SACRE meeting and it was just instantly re rejected. Um, I asked if I could come in and have a discussion with them about why I wanted to join, um, but there was no scope for that at all. There, it was just a flat rejection with no discussion, no explanation. Um, now, I didn't take this uh, very well and spoke to Humanist UK about it, who put me in touch with David Wolf, and we sent a pre-action letter to uh, the local council saying that um, it was against the Human Rights Act that non-religious beliefs such as humanism should be treated equally to religious beliefs. And uh, they responded by pointing me to a document called Circular 1094. In England, it's Circular 194, but it's the same wording, which um, is a piece of statutory guidance that says the inclusion of representatives of belief systems such as humanism, which do not amount to a religion or religious domination, um, would be contrary to the legal provisions in the Act. So basically banning humanists from sitting on sacres with voting rights. So the pre-action letter was met with quite a forceful um, rejection again from the Vale Council, um, who said they'd carried out an equality impact assessment. They felt that they'd made the right decision and that um, humanists had no place on sacres. So we commenced the judicial review process um, and that led to the veil saying to the courts that there was no public interest in this case and it shouldn't be accepted. But that, that again, that argument was rejected and a hearing date was set for October 2017. At this point, the council asked if we could defer that hearing date for them to consult with Welsh Government, because understandably, this was a case that wasn't going to just affect the Vale, it would affect the 22 local authorities across Wales. And so we agreed to the deferral, which then led to a letter coming in May 2018 to all 22 local authorities from the wonderful Kirsty Williams, who was Education Minister at that time, saying that humanists should be given access to sacres uh, in the same way that religious groups were. Um, her letter said that to ensure compatibility with the Human Rights Act, um, that non-religious beliefs needed to be treated equally to religious beliefs where they were analogous to those religious beliefs um, and that it was her opinion that humanists were allowed to be on sacres and this wording would then replace the uh, circular 1094. So there was still some objection to that, but we've come a long way. So in 2017, we had no representatives on SACRES. Um, we now have 18 out of the 22 with humanists having full representation. And I'm now vice chair of Vale of Glamorgan SACRE. So I was accepted and it's now a very harmonious SACRE. We, we all work really well together. It didn't just stop there though, because Wales has been going through a period of reviewing its uh, curriculum, uh, a whole scale review of the curriculum. And in 2021, they passed the Curriculum and Assessment Wales Act, um, which took over from Circular 1094 and wrote into law that non-religious philosophical convictions should be treated equally to religious beliefs and given access to sacres. But more than that, should be um, reflected in the teaching and learning of religion, values and ethics, which is the new name for RE or religious education in Wales. So our small case from back in uh, 2016 with the Vale of Glamorgan <clears throat> had a much deeper impact. It's allowed for non-religious beliefs to be treated on par with religious beliefs uh, throughout education in Wales to the point now where I'm involved in writing the professional learning material for teachers across Wales, so that when they're teaching about religion, values and ethics, they'll be teaching about humanism alongside many other religious beliefs and giving it that fair, critical, objective and pluralistic approach um, that we all desire to see in education. Um, so I'm really glad we took the judicial review. I'm glad the process was there. It didn't come to fruition because it didn't need to. 
we reached a resolution. But had we not taken the case, I do, honestly don't believe we'd be where we are now with SACRE membership or with the curriculum. I think it had a, a direct impact on the decisions that were made about that new piece of education legislation. Unfortunately, there's been no such progress in England um, where some SACRES have admitted full uh, humanist members in full um, voting positions. Some have co-opted. Many others still refuse to accept humanists. Um, and it may be the, the case that we try and take a similar case in England um, to see if we can reach the same sort of outcome. Um, it was a tool available to us that allowed us to really raise the profile of a discriminatory piece of statutory guidance that hadn't been dealt with and that would still be in place if we hadn't taken that case and is still in place in England. So I, I firmly believe the judicial review system is there for all of our benefits. It's a really important facility that we have to challenge public bodies when they have practices that are discriminatory. Um, and it's part of the Human Rights Act. So what I'd really like to do now is pass over to David to be able to talk to you about the actual uh, legal implications and the, of the, the changes that are being recommended to the Human Rights Act. But I'm not sure if he's with us yet, Toby, is he? Uh, no, I'm afraid he's he's um, still struggling. He's trying to get in contact with the conference organiser. Ah, ah I as if too by soon. magic. Hello. David, I Hi. was just about to pass over to you. OK, I'm going to try. How do I screen, share my screen? How I see it's down. Bottom. David, okay. you're you're in the screen. Uh, this is Jonathan Marks. And, um, uh, I, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, perhaps I should. I'm the uh, House of Lords spokesperson on justice issues. I did, in David's absence, say a word or two about, um, David, your, your practice uh, in Matrix Chambers as a human rights, environmental um, uh, and public lawyer. Uh, you know, I think, a great deal more than most of us about a judicial review. Cathy's given us some, uh, an extremely interesting and worthwhile um, account of um, her position uh, on sacrosum with the ju judicial review that um, you together took. Uh, and um, th that has been an introduction to the, the subject. And I'd like now to ask you to be our second speaker uh, on the Human Rights Act uh, and the wider implications uh, I'm, I'm the government's proposal. I'm delighted to do that. I'm just seeing how I share my screen. I was just speaking to a very helpful conference organiser a second ago. And you were sharing your screen previously and you've gone blank now. So uh, if you clicked on a button, you probably better click on the button. Again. Better? I don't think I clicked on the button. Uh, there should be a camera icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yeah, I've got that. I've just clicked on that. Yes, and you're halfway there. Um, it's you not showing your image yet. You've got my... I was I was seeing David's image. What I wasn't seeing... Yeah, was no, you're not seeing my screen, screen share. No, I'm maybe, just maybe, I should, initials. maybe I should deal with it without the... Um, I have an icon, David, that shows me <coughs> what looks like a monitor. And I think if you click oh. on that, that might just show you. Does that help me? Is that helping? Did I just did that? No. Maybe I'll just do it without the uh, without the PowerPoint then, which is a shame. OK, um, I'll, shall I press on? Um, so my name's David Wolf. I'm going to talk very briefly about the Human Rights Act. Where are we now? Um, to do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a quick potted history of Human Rights Act. Starts um, 1950s European Convention on Human Rights International Agreement, largely drafted um, by uh, UK lawyers and civil servants. Um, for many, many years, um, that uh, provided, if you like, a sort of long stop for people in the UK uh, who felt that the UK wasn't complying with what then was simply an international obligation around human rights to take their concerns to Strasbourg. Strasbourg, note, not uh, Luxembourg. Um, uh, and that was the position for, for many decades. Um, it didn't really have any effect of embedding uh, those kind of human rights values in our legal system or our culture. 
Human Rights Act 1998 um, created a number of specific statutory obligations which were beneficial in terms of what was then called bringing rights home. One of those, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, made it unlawful for a public authority to act in a way incompatible with the Convention right. Um, so that basically created an obligation across the public sector to act in accordance with Convention rights. Um, and that has had a very powerful normative effect without the need for litigation and that sort of thing. Um, other obligations which are important here um, were Sections 3 and Section 2. Section 3 uh, made it obligatory um, on the court effectively to construe domestic legislation in accordance with Strasbourg Convention rights and Strasbourg Convention jurisprudence. Um, and that, that was uh, uh, very powerful in terms of uh, uh, assisting the courts in understanding um, wh where, uh, um, uh, where to go with how to understand and apply the human rights obligations that were coming from Strasbourg. And that made the Human Rights uh, Convention um, in effect domestically enforceable. And that really was the position then for many, many decades and indeed remains the position, although as I'm about to mention is now slightly in jeopardy. Um, in terms of humanist victories and humanist developments in that period, let me just give you some highlights. Um, you'll be aware, I suspect, of, of the issues around assisted suicide. So the history of that is quite interesting because in 2001, Diane Pretty took her case to the House of Lords and the House of Lords said that Article 8 wasn't engaged in the right to assisted suicide, Article 8 the right to respect for private and family life. Um, she went to Strasbourg, uh, the Strasbourg court disagreed, said Article 8 was engaged, so that was great, it wasn't so great for her, but it was great for the development of the law. It did assist then Debbie Purdy, um, sh she wanted comfort that her family member wouldn't be prosecuted if they took her essentially to Switzerland to uh, Dignitas. Um, but her problem was that she didn't know because of the DPP's policy at the time whether her family member would be prosecuted or not. Um, and so she too went to the House of Lords uh, and in the light of Diane Pretty's um, success in Strasbourg, the House of Lords said, well, you still haven't got a right to assisted suicide, but you do have a right to some clarity about the circumstances in which the DPP will prosecute your family member. So that was a success for Debbie Purdy and we now have DPP policy that is um, uh, very helpful in that regard. As you possibly know, Mr. Nicholson tried to take that one step further, um, but unfortunately he's been knocked back. So we see how um, access to Strasbourg courts and access to the Human Rights Act has been of assistance in relation to the journey on assisted suicide. We we'll probably won't take it any further. Um, another similar humanist journey with the Human Rights Act around humanist marriages. You may know that in 2005, um, a registrar in Scotland um, applying the human rights obligations arising from the Human Rights Act interpreted the Scottish legislation um, to enable um, a humanist marriage in Scotland. Slightly more complicated in Northern Ireland because it took some litigation, but again, um, in a case called Smith and then subsequent uh, legislative intervention, um, Northern Ireland evolved through Articles 9 and Articles 14 of the Human Rights uh, Convention as seen through the Human Rights Act, um, humanist marriages in Northern Ireland. You then have a case called Fox, this is now into education, a case called Fox and the Secretary of State for Education, which I was involved in with the Humanist Association as one of the litigants. That was about the GCSE curriculum and the relationship between the GCSE curriculum and the RE curriculum. Um, the RE curriculum was required um, effectively by domestic law and international Strasbourg Convention jurisprudence to be um, broad based, to be um, uh, tolerant of a range of religious views and non-religious worldviews and so on. So that was RE. The problem was that the government in London produced a GCSE curriculum that was only religion and then basically said you can teach RE by teaching GCSE. And the domestic court, the High Court said that's not permissible because if you only teach the, R, the, 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 the religious component, you won't be doing the RE bit. So Fox was a great case um, of using um, what the Strasbourg law had said through the prism of the Human Rights Act to inform the domestic uh, school uh, curriculum. And then you've got the Sacre challenges that I know cathy has been talking about. And this was very much taking um, principles from a case called Williamson um, and using the notion that religion means religion or belief to then inform um, the language of the domestic legislation. So where the domestic legislation requires representatives of religions, humanists have argued that it means representatives of religious 
uh, groups or non-religious worldview groups. So that's been very important. I'm sure, as Cathy's mentioned, um, that hasn't yet got to court. Ironically, it's been a sort of rolling programme of confronting local authorities, each of whom has sort of squared up for a fight and then rolled over. So interestingly, that one is just being trickled out one by one across England. Wales is now um, doing it by legislation. So we see in those different examples across um, assisted suicide, across human marriage, across the curriculum, how the Human Rights Act giving domestic effect to the European Convention has been very powerful um, in, in embedding some of the values of the Convention in a way that's particularly supportive um, for, for humanists and those with non-religious worldviews. Um, I should stress, I've mentioned this already, very important to remember though that the European, uh, uh, the, the Human Rights Act is not merely um, about litigation and high profile cases, it's also about what lawyers would call a normative effect, um, it's had a very powerful impact um, without cases being brought to court across a whole sphere of human activity in the UK, for example, um, I, I've done some work around care homes. Um, it's a lot been along uh, the, the situation that care homes have um, started to embed human rights values within the way they deal with people in their care homes. I'm not always the case, of course, we've got some spectacular failures. Um, but, but as a way of um, propagating a, a culture, if you like, um, the fact that public funded uh, uh, care homes are subject to Section 6 of the Human Rights Act ha has meant that those care homes have, um, for example, when it came to family members visiting and all sorts of things, have um, improved their uh, performance and their behaviour without, I think, cases ever really having to go to court. So the Human Rights Act has had a profound benefit, both in terms of um, specific litigation of the kind I mentioned, you know, the, the pretties, the purdies and so on. Um, uh, local authorities caving in in the face of um, powerful arguments. That's the Cathy's case and others around sacres, but also simply in public bodies upping their game to take into account human rights values. Along in 2020 comes something called the Independent Human Rights Act Review, initiated by the current government. Um, they put in place a committee of the great and good, including some um, senior uh, lawyers who not by any means renowned for being passionate human rights advocates. So it's so by no means a, a, a partisan group. Um, and I think slightly to the government's surprise, that independent group um, didn't come up with what I think the government was hoping for, which was a, a panning of a human rights act. They actually came up with a series of very modest recommendations, um, the most serious of which I will, will read to you because I think it's quite important. Um, their most significant recommendation was this. Serious consideration should be given by the government to developing an effective programme of civic and constitutional education in schools, etc. Such a programme should particularly focus on questions about human rights and the balance to be struck between such rights, individuals, responsibility. So very interestingly, ra rather than um, suggesting that the Human Rights Act needed significant amendment, this independent group actually recommended that um, we, the public, needed to be better educated about the Human Rights Act. So that was rather telling. Um, I think the reality, though, is that that's not what Dominic Raab, um, uh, the current Deputy Prime Minister, had wanted to hear. He's been a long agitator around the Human Rights Act. So he, um, in his capacity as Deputy Prime Minister and Lord Chancellor, um, ha has initiated, and we're now in the middle of a process of what they're calling Human Rights Act reform, and they're proposing a modern Bill of Rights. Um, it's actually, um, in some ways, not, not as dramatic as the headline might sound, because um, they're not proposing by any means to repeal the Human Rights Act, but what they are contemplating, and the consultation has now effectively closed, but what they're uh, contemplating is a, is a very significant um, undermining of some of the key principles of the mechanics of the Human Rights Act. Um, we can see from the way documents drafted that some of the key policies are things that you might not be surprised of in this government. So there's quite a lot of stuff around freedom of speech, um, what you might call the woke agenda, or some people might call the woke agenda, issues around privacy, also issues around deportation, government concerns about not being able to deport foreign criminals, um, migration, no surprise there, and then the extraterritorial effects of the Human Rights Act, those cases where British soldiers have been held accountable for war crimes and similar when acting in um, Iraq and Afghanistan. So um, no surprise that those are the policy drivers. In terms of the specifics of what the government is, at least at the moment, asking for consultation responses about, 
Um, the first, I'm going to just give you a couple of two or three headlines. There's a lot of detail behind this, but two or three headlines. One of the things they are contemplating um, is suggesting to the courts that the courts look beyond the Strasbourg um, ECHR jurisprudence and look at other countries. Now, in one sense, that might sound like a beneficial cry to internationalism, but I think anybody who looks at it realises that that's actually a recipe for complete chaos and confusion. So that's not going to um, assist in the development of a coherent human rights culture. Um, but the second um, question they're asking about is whether, in effect, the Supreme Court should be less deferential to the Strasbourg Court. But I think everybody who's looked at this, who knows this sphere, realises that actually um, the Supreme Court hasn't been deferential to Strasbourg in quite the way that the Conservatives fear for many, many years. There was an early flurry of activity in the early days of the Human Rights Act when um, really Strasbourg was treated as something of a court of appeal by the domestic courts, but that's not the case. So this does rather like, seem like, um, as I think they say, tilting at rocking horses. It's, it's a bit of a historic problem. Um, perhaps more problematically for, you might think, people like humanists, groups like humanists in terms of their concerns, um, it is question eight, and I'll read that a little bit slowly. Question eight, do you consider that a condition that individuals must have suffered a significant disadvantage to bring a claim should be a threshold for a legal challenge? And then question nine, sorry, question 10, how else should the government best ensure the courts can focus on, quote, genuine human rights abuses? Um, now, my, my, my worry and my concern is that um, uh, there's obviously there some sense there that not all human rights concerns are significant and not all human rights concerns are ones that should be vindicated. And my concern is that um, it, it may be thought by some people that issues like um, whether you can have a humanist marriage, whether the curriculum teaches your non-religious worldviews and so on, are somehow less important than other human rights uh, entitlements under the European Convention and under the Human Rights Act. Uh, and my worry is that um, a scheme might be designed by the government in the light of this consultation, which is designed to filter out what they regard as trivial or vexatious claims coming from prisoners or asylum seekers or whatever it may be, and then in, in the course of that catch um, issues which are very important to significant groups of people, such as the humanist issues that I've identified in the last few minutes. So my worry is that um, wh whilst these proposals do have, would have, if implemented, a significant effect across the board, they may have a particular effect in areas where um, perhaps the concerns around freedom of religion and so on are seen as, quote, less significant. So I think this is very much a watch this space. The consultation generally closed last week, although um, ironically there's an extension on the consultation for people reliant on the easy read version of the consultation document that was only produced late in the process. So it's not entirely closed. Um, obviously, we now wait to see what the government does with the consultation responses. I know that a lot of very powerful organisations like Liberty, Justice, Public Law Project and indeed Humanist UK have put in very powerful responses of concern. Presumably, we will then get a consultation response document from the government um, and perhaps possibly, depending on where that goes, proposals for legislative reform. So this one is definitely going to run. Um, it's definitely one to watch and it's definitely one that I know you will be looking to Jonathan Marks and others to have particular vigilance in relation to um, when these things become uh, parliamentary, as they probably will. So um, I think I've said enough. I'm sure I've gone on too long. Um, uh, and that's, um, I hope, uh, not too quick a canter through Human Rights Act. Where are we now? Jonathan, you're, you're not on microphone yet. OK, that's uh, uh, unmuting proof difficult. D David, thank you very much indeed. That was a really um, helpful uh, canter through a very wide area and um, I think there are two questions that that I'd just like to raise with you before we go on to um, uh, other questions. The first is really for, for Kathy and it it links in with what you've been talking about David that and that is the importance that Kathy placed on JR as a tool to enforce our Human Rights Act um, uh, rights and I've just been dealing with the JR and Courts Bill, which presents quite sophisticated, but I think quite serious um, threats to the JR system. One is the, the power to make um, quashing orders prospective only, that's looking forward, which threatens those people who've already been um, affected by uh, 
unlawful action and haven't themselves taken action. Uh, and also the presumption that the court should exercise those powers. And there's also the ending of the supervisory role and in respect of um, uh, some cases, mostly immigration cases, where um, the upper tribunal has refused permission to appeal from uh, the first tier tribunal. And that ties in with what, David, you were saying about um, the consultation and the threats that are proposed. Uh, and one thing I think you might like to consider uh, in that context is how far the supremacy of the Supreme Court that is proposed, which you thought wasn't dangerous in what you said, um, threatens to undermine in a Dominic Raab ideal world um, our reliance on the Stras Strasbourg Court setting the standard for compliance with convention rights. Yeah, I mean, um, I obviously didn't talk about the interaction between the rights and the judicial review stuff, but you, you've introduced that very helpfully, Jonathan. I mean, there, there is a there is a bit of a pincer movement coming in both those directions. First of all, in undermining the substantive rights, but also in um, chipping away at the, the judicial review procedure elements of that. Um, uh, I mean, we we we've over the last um, twenty years of the Human Rights Act. I think I think um, everybody who really looks at these things closely takes the view that. Um, the Supreme Court has established a quite a nuanced and sophisticated um, uh, UK based, you know, all the things you might want to have um, relationship with the Strasbourg jurisprudence, which means that it's not treated as being a simple court of appeal. Um, we do, as a, as a, as a uh, legal system, um, uh, tailor the Strasbourg jurisprudence to uh, our common law traditions and all those sorts of things. They do take into account the sort of uh, values and traditions of the UK um, in the way that the international obligations are supposed to do. And that is all, um, uh, I think most people think, working rather well. Um, uh, of course, there are occasions where Strasbourg says things that the UK doesn't like and, and so on, but they that's in a way in the nature of the relationship. And, and what the government is now doing is trying to throw that up in the air because I think you know they've had some spectacular instances where they've really been very unhappy about what Strasbourg has said. I think I didn't mention it, but I think possibly you know, one of the clearest examples of that is around prisoner voting. Um, but you've also had um, uh, examples of, of you know, the issues which give rise to the difficulty that the government has of um, sometimes deporting uh, 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 what they, the people they think should be deported because of the people's um, family ties and so on. So um, I think I think all of those things are now imperiled. It's hard to see exactly how that will work. And I think the other thing to say about the consultation, at least on the Human Rights Act, is that um, Sometimes these consultation questions and proposals are sort of kite flying and, and it's possible that some of these things are designed as a little bit of um, you know, red meat to the Tory backbenchers um, and, and won't necessarily come forward or come forward in this in this form. But we do know that Dominic Raab has been um, very much on this agenda for well, most of his parliamentary career. So um, uh, it's worrying times in that regard. Yes, Kathy, would you like to say anything on that? And then Toby may have some questions from the floor that he wants to, to put. If from my perspective, the judicial review process was um, central to being able to create the change that we have in Wales and having non-religious beliefs being treated fairly and equally with religious beliefs as they should be under the Human Rights Act. Um, and if we didn't have the judicial pro uh, review process as we have it, then that wouldn't have been able to happen. So there was a challenge by the Vale of Glamorgan to say the case that we were trying to bring wasn't in the public interest. That validation is already there. The court will all, already take that into account. It was in the public interest. It was of interest to enough people. Um, so to take it further um, and ha have to qualify the amount of harm that's been done before a case could be taken, that would probably rule out my case. And if these changes are accepted, then I wouldn't have been able to bring my case. Mm. We wouldn't be in the healthy position we are now in Wales. Um, and we wouldn't have the opportunity to achieve the same sort of change in England. So I know the Welsh Government don't support changes. They would like the, the Human Rights Act to stay as it is. And they've said so in their response to the consultation. And we are in that fortunate position in Wales. But obviously, it's not a devolved issue. Uh, so they can respond to the consultation but can't make the decision in their own right. 
Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, can I just say a little bit more in terms of the judicial review position? I, mean, I, I, I spend my life bringing judicial review claims against public authorities on behalf of claimants. That's basically all I do. Um, and very often I think it's the cases that we don't bring that, that make the difference, but it's the possibility of bringing the case that's critical. So, so you know, all those care homes I mentioned who've upped their game on, you know, um, family members visiting relatives and things like that. Um, and, you know, other examples, you know, the, the registrar in Scotland who did a Human Rights Act convention, uh, you know, compliant interpretation to allow humanist marriage. Those are examples of public bodies which um, uh, act lawfully. And of course, it might be that they would act lawfully regardless, but judicial review as a long stop tool to hold them to account is fundamental. Um, and, and if we took away judicial review or we significantly undermined it, then um, of course it's possible, you know, and one would like to think that all those public bodies would continue acting lawfully, but enough of them don't act lawfully, even with the um, uh, the oversight of judicial review, that, that I think that would be um, somewhat naive and, and um, you know, uh, 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 reckless position in a sense. You know, the number of judicial reviews brought in the year is, in a small number of thousands, the number of public body decisions taken in a year is in the, I don't know, how would you count it? Millions and millions. <laughs> um, so it's it's quite an effective system of providing um, uh, a check and balance. And, and if it's undermined, whether that's in relation to Human Rights Act questions or generally, that is a big problem, I think, for the rule of law. Yes, I think that's a very important point. The um, What people also don't know is the number of threats of JR applications that yep. make public bodies back down. Um, the Absolutely. threat to end the so-called CART JRs, those are the immigration JRs that I was uh, talking about a moment ago, uh, where the supervisory ju jurisdiction is going to be removed if the government gets its way. The government have promised to give me an answer, but they haven't yet, on the number that have settled and the number that have stopped deportations by being settled. Uh, and people don't know about that. The government has picked on the very small number of successful challenges that have been heard in court and been successful. There's a whole raft of challenges, further challenges that have been successful because the government's changed its mind or the, um, the body's changed its mind. Um, Toby, would you like to bring in any of the questions from the, from the chat? Uh, yes, I can do so. Can I first uh, start by suggesting to David that if you click on the gear wheel, on the right hand side of your icons that may give you the ability to reactivate your camera mm. um, that is assuming that your eye camera icon has not been crossed through my camera icon is not crossed through good um, uh, the gear wheel um oops, uh, that should give you audio video settings yeah. uh, as long as you can hear me. I mean, you don't need okay, to see me. Fine. <laughs> um, there haven't been a huge number of questions, so I may have to improvise, and that does mean... I'm, happy to, to, I'm happy, to, happy to chat away for hours. What we do have is a question <laughs> from Jaska Lanko. Yes, um, indeed. Which is a, a general question which we've, we've sort of covered, but where is Rob in his process of demolishing our Human Rights Act and rewriting them to his liking? In other words, we talked about what the consultation says, but we haven't looked about uh, at Rob's personal position. Of course, he's been beefed up when he lost the foreign secretaryship, and um, he's now not just justice secretary; he's deputy prime minister. Uh, it's a political question, I suppose. But have you, David, any um, clue as to where Rob is actually looking to go? Well, I, 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 I suspect. <laughs> Really, the question, I mean, you know, this is very much his personal project. Um, uh, and, and there was a, I think there was a great sentence in the um, introduction to the, the conversation. I'll see if I can find it. Oh, it's here we are. As I told you about the, the Human Rights Act, um, the independent review, which didn't come up with the right answer. Um, there's a lovely, charming sentence here, which says this in the, in the Raab consultation. This consultation marks the next step in the development of the UK's tradition about upholding human rights. It has been informed by the work done by Sir Peter Gross and the panel he chaired. Um, this informed word is a very, is a very um, delightful um, because it's not been informed by that at all. Well, informed and, and they put that to one side. So this does look very much like um, the Deputy Prime Minister's personal agenda. And therefore, I think the questions in it are um, giving us a fairly clear signpost. So in terms of in terms of the substantive policy areas, 
that he and the Conservative Party are concerned about. I think it is deportation of um, uh, uh, foreign prisoners and so on. It is um, British soldiers being prosecuted for atrocities committed um, abroad. Um, uh, and those kind of um, well-known high level uh, issues. The difficulty is that um, the the way in which those things play out, there's, there's no Human Rights Act provision. There's nothing in, this, in the Human Rights Act or the Strasbourg Convention which says you can prosecute soldiers or, or um, conversely, you can't deport prisoners. Those are things evolved. Um, those are consequences enumerated by courts from um, the much more general rights. So, so a right to respect for private and family life, which benefits us all in all sorts of different ways, has been interpreted in, in, in relation to deportations. And so it's going to be quite difficult for the government, if you like, to carve off those individual discrete bits. Now, um, uh, let's see where it goes. But I do think that's, that's the political um, conjuring trick that Dominic Raab is trying to pull off. Yes, I, I think that's right. I wonder whether what they really have in their sights is by elevating what they see as the possibility of domestic jurisprudence um, and perhaps adding further legislation in due course of weakening the influence of the Strasbourg court in making sure that our compliance with the convention is what they see as desirable compliance with the convention or whether they're trying to loosen the bonds while keeping us in the convention because they've realized they can't leave it yeah i mean i, th I think that's entirely right jonathan i mean keeping us in the convention loosening the bonds is a is a very difficult thing to do um so so uh we should be reassured that they're not leaving the not going to leave the convention i suppose that's we can bank that as a sort of um uh, 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 low watermark. Um, ironically, of course, I mean, just to step sideways and pick up an, an, another point, ironically, of course, at any point in the last um, 20 years, Parliament could always, by primary legislation, override convention rights. The Human Rights Act doesn't trump other primary legislation. It's very clear in that regard. So there have been um, some situations in which um, primary legislation is trumping Strasbourg. Um, or trumping Human Rights Act, trumping Strasbourg. And, and if the government really wanted to do that, could push it through Parliament, they would do it. Um, but that is very, uh, that then looks very blunt and very focused and very sort of um, uh, aggressive um, domestically. Um, and it also then leaves us bang conflicting with Strasbourg. And in those situations, there would definitely be, as there were pre-1998, instances of individuals going from the UK to Strasbourg, indeed prisoner voting is an example of this, and getting Strasbourg findings against the UK. So, so the government, you know, at least we should, I suppose, be grateful for the government being embarrassed enough um, or concerned enough not to want to override um, with primary legislation and not to therefore leave us directly in breach of international law. Um, and so this Raab package is their attempt to somehow wiggle their way through that. Um, difficult to see how it works. I don't think I don't think sort of informed commentators really see how it's going to work in, in any, um, even to deliver what the government wants actually. Yes. Toby, there's a a question from Stuart Moore asked at uh, 1312 towards the top of the chat. Do you want to um, to come in on that one? It's really a question for, for Cathy, I think. Um, I can answer that. Uh, the, it, Stuart asks, is the opportunity to remove the postcode lottery we sacres? Unfortunately, sacres aren't that powerful, uh, despite us making this huge fuss to get onto them. They're about what's taught within RE or RVE, um, and they are also about enforcing collective worship, uh, which is another uh, questionable issue that hopefully we'd get to bring a, a judicial review case on soon to challenge that if the uh, the Assembly's bill doesn't get passed. Um, but no, SACRAs are just about making sure that RV, RE is being taught appropriately um, and contains that objective, critical and pluralistic approach um, and that uh, schools have all the right support in place to deliver that. We don't have say over faith schools um, or how school admissions are managed. I, I, I always, I always um, uh, 
wonder about concerns about postcode lotteries because in one sense postcode lottery is a pejorative way of describing local democracy um and so so the, the question for me really is 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 this by which we mean the the re curriculum in sc local schools is that something that should be decided locally or should it be decided nationally and and you can make a case for saying it should be decided locally now I, i'm not sure i'd agree with that case but that that's the flip side of it so postcode lottery is one of those funny expressions and of course we've got a postcode lottery now in in well in in multiple ways with these sacres because we've got the postcode lottery of whether you're in wales or not with wales having moved in a benevolent direction but within england um the postcode lottery now is um ha has your local authority either under or your yes your local authority either of its own volition or under pressure from the humanists um taken a human rights compliant approach to the uh, 1996 education act to allow humanists as full-time representatives on the sacre or is it one of those that is still um in the in the woods as it were um and as i as i mentioned before you have this slightly odd um activity of of um the humanists almost going around the country picking on local authorities one by one each time there's a humanist who wants to be on the local sacre who gets rejected i think the humanist uk take up their cause uh, and it is a bit like the uh, i think it's the black knight scene from monty python the kind of come back and fight um i can't remember i don't think i've ever had anything quite like this where we've threatened so many judicial reviews and no, all these local authorities get very sort of aggressive at the beginning and then when they realize that it's going to cost them lots of money and they probably lose they um they all rush away with their um, tails between their legs so um it does have a python-esque quality but that it really you know the development to go back to the postcode lottery concern the development of um humanist or non-religious worldview involvement in sacrates should not be like that it should not be that chaotic that is not um good government um uh, i suspect the problem is that the government in uh, you know the westminster government um hasn't got the clarity of thinking or the bravery um either to face down the humanists if you like which would be strasbourg non-compliant or to do with what the welsh government's done and and positively embrace not people with non-religious worldviews within sacrifice i think they're still caught in a in a bit of a sort of um, Anglican, I suppose, mindset. Um, I, I just don't know, or a religious mindset. So, so um, the, the, the human right, the, I'm sorry, the postcode lottery is, is um, really playing out in a bonkers way on this particular sphere. We were very lucky that Kirsty Williams decided to make a decision for the whole of Wales yeah. um, based on the, the potential of my one uh, judicial review case. So we didn't have to um, to repeat the case again and again. Um, but like uh, David said, that's what's happening in England at the moment because um, we can't get that national decision. Um, so there are flaws with the system, but it certainly worked in our case in Wales. We had a willing government, though, to make the change. But at least we have judicial review as a tool to to um to go through this bonkers process. But Kathy's right, isn't she? That the political will matters enormously. I mean, when Absolutely. we when we come up against uh, an intransigent and a human rights averse uh, government, it is very difficult to to change their mind. Um, Alexandra Dominique has reminded us all that there are questions on the Q&A as well as on the chat. Um, and Alexandra asks this, you've also clearly expressed that our rights with, re with regards to the Human Rights Act review are under threat. As the consultation is now essentially closed, what do you recommend we do as individuals and as a party? Uh, and before I ask um, our panelists to answer that, can I say that as far as a party is concerned, We've just put in at the close, towards the close of the um, consultation, a very strong response to the consultation, defending the existing position and pointing out how well the Human Rights Act is working uh, and how important it is to keep uh, the jurisprudence in accordance with the uh, convention rights and in accordance with the Strasbourg Court um, and the, the present architecture and the way it works, which is um, part serendipitous, part genius, and it's um, it has in fact worked very well indeed, uh, most of us would believe. But what else can we do as individuals as in a party? Um, shall Cathy answer that first and then David? Uh, move to Wales. That would be <laughs> a solution for you all. Um, we do seem to be doing things in a better approach here. Um, 
I don't have an answer for you as a party as to what you should do. Um, all we can do in the interim is keep challenging public bodies where we find discrimination. We find uh, they are, are not complying with the Human Rights Act. Um, but as to how you would take it forward to make sure that there aren't the changes that are being pro proposed, um, I wouldn't have an answer for that. I'd hand over to David, who would have more advice. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, mm, and I'm sort of hesitate because I'm here as a lawyer and this is very much a, a, a capital P political question. Um, I, I mean, it, 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 lots of lawyers have had um, lots of input into these consultation responses, including, I suspect, the one that Jonathan's talking about. Um, um, and I've read several of them and they're, you know, very powerfully written. Um, uh, it now is really in the sort of, you know, political handle turning stage. Um, we will, I'm sure, get a response document back. It won't be quick because there's a lot there. Um, and we'll then have presumably white paper or whatever it might be leading to legislation if that's the way the then government goes. But I think this then falls back into the sort of general political turmoil of the moment. And and will we in six or 12 months time have, um, you know, where will Dominic Raab be? What will the government look like? What will their majority look like? What will their um, stomach for this kind of thing look like? Because um, you know, Human Rights Act reform is not is not by any means something that all the Conservative Party would support. There are, there are some very powerful supporters of human rights uh, in the Conservative Party and Conservative um, uh, members in Parliament. So I don't think it's by any means a done deal in terms of the Dominic Raab package. Um, uh, uh, so we wait and see, I suspect, and then it will play out in the politics of the, of the time. Um, I mean, Jonathan, in a way, is the one who's probably closest to all of those things. Yes, well, I think there are two aspects to this. One is national and the other is local. As far as the national politics is concerned, I mean, unsurprisingly, I'm very keen on parliamentary action. And um, in particular, because the government doesn't have a majority in the House of Lords uh, and the crossbenchers have a very powerful voice, particularly in this context, an extrajudicial voice. Uh, and excellent certain voice as well, the former cabinet secretaries and so forth, all on side for, for human rights. Um, we need to make sure that we chip away at any legislative proposals after they've um, come to us from the Commons, send back um, rafts of amendments as we have done with the um, police uh, court sentencing, crime court sentencing and courts bill. Uh, and really challenge the government to come back to us if they dare and to get rid of the worst parts of it. So I think at a national level, that's certainly what we can do. And sometimes when things happen as they are at the moment at the end of the session, they don't have the time to get things through unless they make concessions because they're concerned that we'll send things back for a second time. But at a local level, the government and actually the right wing press have been very successful at rubbishing the Human Rights Act saying it's all about um, helping people who shouldn't be helped, stopping criminals getting deported, um, protecting people in the name of their family life from um, the consequences of um, local authority action and so forth, which people they say would be justified. And I think what we really need to be doing at a local level is asking the question, um, which is in the uh, title of this meeting, what has the Human Rights Act done for us? And I think that's really very important. If we can show people what the Human Rights Act has done for us, and that was the, that wonderful sketch about what the Human Rights Act has done for us in the past, um, then I think we can start to make headway to make people love the Human Rights Act and value human rights, which I think we've actually failed to do in the past. And since it was a really landmark piece of legislation pioneered by, yes, uh, the Labour Party and by us, but also by um, many Conservatives, uh, as David has said, and it originating with the um, Tory architects of the, of the convention. I think there's a lot we can do to change public opinion against Rob uh, on this, and I, I hope we will do. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think as I mentioned, I, mean, I, I think that's entirely right. The, the the Human Rights Act review, which was the body that was put in place, you know, by the government to with the hope that it would rubbish the Human Rights Act, and it didn't. And as I said, their 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 headline recommendation was um, serious consideration to be given to developing an effective program of civic and constitutional education in schools. 
So, so no, it's not that the human rights is wrong. It's that we don't understand it. <laughs> we don't. We don't understand how it works. Um, and, I, and I do wonder. I mean, going back to Jonathan's point about the sort of um, stories in the press and so on. You know, the, 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 it's hard to tell really. But the days of the days of the sort of fake news. You know, prisoner not uh, deported because of his cat, and you know, all those kind of. I mean, there really was a lot of what we now would genuinely call fake news stories about the Human Rights Act in the in the early days. And I wonder the extent those have now subsided a bit. Um, and and um, people are less frothy about it because there's certainly bits in in this government consultation which are definitely uh, um, sort of digging up old issues which you know, they really come from 15 years ago um, um, and I don't know whether that's the extent that people are still still stressing about those things. Yes, I, I think that's 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 a powerful point. The, the climate has changed and can change further. Um, Christina Milrell asks, um, human rights reform, Why does that? what does that reform mean for the people of the UK? Is it going to be fair to those with disabilities and the LGBT plus community? Um, can, can you say something about that, the, the people with um, all sorts of protective characteristics, really? Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, um, one of the one of the powerful things in the convention is is um article 14 which is the prohibition on discrimination um article 14 is an interesting discrimination or anti-discrimination provision because it only works in relation to um whether when one of your other convention rights is engaged so to take for example the humanist marriage example um the court in northern ireland held that uh, Article 9, which is the right to religious freedom and so on, um, engaged, uh, uh, was engaged in a, in a marriage and therefore humanists needed equal access to marriage. Um, I'm slightly simplifying. So it was a discrimination argument in the end that won, won that case. So the discrimination provisions in the convention have always been um, very, very important in, in that sort of way. Um, so I do worry about how that plays out with uh, LGBT community in particular. Um, I think there will be, you know, the other thing I mentioned, I think that's in the background of all of this is, is issues around freedom of speech. And so I think there may well be a, a, an interaction between some of the government's agenda on, on uh, discrimination and free speech and what I call, I don't like this term, but people know what it means, the woke, uh, the woke agenda, the woke concerns. Again, something I think is sort of dramatically overstated and blown up by people who've got their own different agendas. But um, I think I think you see um, uh, echoes of some of that stuff in this consultation, and that is obviously causing massive concerns for the trans community at the moment. For example, so um, I think we do need to be worried about that. Yes, Toby, I'm right. I think in saying we have um, until quarter past. That's correct, isn't it? Well, I'm going to proceed yeah, I'm, on. I'm not sure where Toby is, but yes, yes, yes. I have John. Yes. Um, so Stuart Moore has another question, uh, and he asks, can you advise me, how do I respond to the ostensible C of E school of my granddaughter requiring her to give up something for Lent? So <laughs> basically a, a completely religiously oriented um, C of E um practice can i come in on this one please do yes kathy so uh stuart i mean the the right to withdraw which is actually strangely being taken away in wales uh but that's because uh, rv is, uh, is fully inclusive and objective and pluralistic uh, as it's not in england and certainly not in a c of e school but there is still the right to withdraw from re or collective worship and that right to withdraw is whole or part so you can just withdraw a child from a small section of re um so it is within the parent or the guardian's right to say to the school my child would not be required to take part in this um, and to challenge them and they have to abide by that um, and if they don't then they're, they're, they are not upholding your right of uh, withdrawing your child from whole or part of RVE RV. um, so that's the best way to go about it if that doesn't work and they're still uh, trying to enforce those particular uh, aspects of, of religious belief um, then the school should be challenged on it um, so, so, so oddly, 
Kathy's given the lawyer's answer, and I'm going to give her. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 um, uh, Kathy's. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with Kathy at all. Obviously, um, you have, or your grandchild has, or your grandchild's parents have, the right to withdraw them selectively in that way. Um, but but one of the interesting um, things about about the right to withdraw is that the courts um, have rightly been sceptical about whether that's a sufficient answer. So not not because um, uh, uh, it's not you know it's not sort of effective at getting you out of the situation. But you go back to the case I talked about Fox. What the judge said there is it's all very well being able to withdraw your children, but that deprives them of the benefit of what they should be getting. So and that certainly that argument has been. Um, run in the context of, of um, the religious content of school assemblies and so on. You know, if the school assembly is the place where we talk about values and ethics and um, concern for others and we hear the news of the school, then it's not an answer to be withdrawn from that. Equally, you, you may you may say, and I just don't know the situation of, of your um, of your grandchild, you may say, well, um, of course we would like to have a nuanced and um, uh, informed conversation about um, poverty and deprivation and um, uh, how we live in a Western materialistic society and, and so on, and have some philosophical discussion about the, um, the, 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 the sort of uh, symbolism of giving things up. Um, and that's what you, you might want your grandchild to be involved in, not, not the binary choice of do I do it, quote, for Lent, or do I, or do I pull out? So um, in the same way as some people have pushed for more inclusive assemblies, you might want to push for more inclusive discussion around um, uh, uh, around the philosophy of um, abstinence or whatever. That, that may be a religious word as well. Anyway, I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, uh, and I think that would be quite an interesting and nuanced discussion to have. I suspect you'd hit a brick wall of ignorance quite quickly. Um, but um, the, the, the just, it's just a sort of different approach to just saying, right, well, we're out in that case. Of course, the right to withdraw is being taken away in September in Wales from RVE um, because it's believed that RVE is a, a fully um, objective subject, uh, just like any other subject. Um, however, it can't be objective um, in a faith school, uh, so, and there are many church in Wales and Catholic schools in Wales. So the, uh, the alternative that's being provided is that parents, rather than withdrawing their children, can demand that faith schools teach non-denominational RVE. So they have to teach two types of RVE now in faith schools, their own denominational version, but where a parent requests it, they're going to have to teach RVE that has no form of, of proselytization um, or no form of saying you must give up something for Lent uh, because that's uh, the tradition within our religion. Um, it's quite an interesting, it'll be interesting to see how that proceeds. I'm sure there'll be challenges on both sides. Cathy, mm -hmm. yes, how does that fit in with the um, permissive regime under which faith, faith schools operate, whereby all that, although now they're not supposed to be selective in their intake, they are allowed to pursue um, a, an ethical approach that accords with uh, um, the religious foundation because uh, it does seem to me that, that there's a bit of a contradiction in that between the pursuing that ethical approach and being all inclusive and rounded in their in their educational approach it's going to be a very interesting few years when the, while this curriculum is being embedded because it is the intent and that the faith school uh, providers have said that they already deliver objective critical and pluralistic rve when it, in, in fact we know they don't because they don't teach non-religious beliefs at all um so that's a challenge uh, that will come up um it exists for um, RSE, Relationships and Sexuality Education as well, which has to be delivered in a non-denominational sense. Um, and that's going to be problematic because the right to withdraw has been removed from that as well. So um, I think there are going to be many, many conversations with the faith school providers who still have a right to uh, deliver RVE in line with the trust deeds um, of the, the religion. Um, but that will contradict the new curriculum. Yes. I, I suspect that what's being described, this giving up something for Lent, is actually probably not part of the RE curriculum in that school. My hunch is that's being done as a generic across the board thing. So um, in, in a sense, even more problematic. 
Yes, Stuart, I don't know whether you can um, put something on the chat to, to explain that point, because it is quite important where the encouragement or the requirement is coming from, whether it's coming from the school um, or from the um, uh, RVE &E, uh, RVE curriculum. We'll, we'll wait and see whether there's a response to that. Toby, have you got any other uh, questions that you've had in? Um, I have one question right at the beginning from Dave Brown, which was, does the same apply in other countries in the UK? And that may have been answered already uh, in effect. But a question that does follow from that is, if there is human rights reform from the government, could it mean that we end up in a situation that we don't have now, where different countries in the UK have different human rights legislation effectively? David, do you want to talk about well, um, well at the moment at the moment the that's um it's not a devolved issue. Um so so as I think she, Cathy made the point in relation to Wales, the same would apply in relation to Scotland and the north of Ireland. Um they can respond in the consultation, but they can't human rights act to the Human Rights Act. So um that isn't on the agenda. So in a sense that becomes a question about um um you know devolution strokes independence rather than a question around the Human Rights Act. You'd have, you'd have to have a change of the constitutional settlement before Human Rights Act, or you know, further devolution or an independence in Scotland before the Human Rights Act. Human Rights Act questions were were sat in 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 you know, Cardiff or Wales, or uh, Cardiff or um, um, Edinburgh or Belfast. There is an important um, aspect of this arising out of the Good Friday Agreement, isn't there? Because the um, mm. Good Friday Agreement have effectively enshrines the Human Rights Act, um, and that in its application to Northern Ireland is of considerable importance. Now, what I suspect the government is going to say at the moment is that nothing they're proposing um, impinges on that. But if they chip away at the Human Rights Act, how far are um, human rights lawyers and others within Northern Ireland going to be able to say that um, the government is in breach of the um, Belfast Agreement? David, have you? No, I mean, I agree. I think that's absolutely right. Um, um, it's another part of the Brexit um, conundrum, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's potentially important as well for, for Scotland, I think, because um, the Scottish independence movement picks on um, threats to the Human Rights Act as something with which they should not be faced. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's hard to see how it wouldn't be another um, put, you know, uh, impetus in that direction. Hmm. Not like Brexit, you know, the, the 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 current tra current current tradition, if that's not an oxymoron, current tradition in Scotland is very um, not only pro-European but pro um, pro human rights values. So um, that can only help Nicola Sturgeon's cause in some sense. There's a, um, a constitutional reform review underway in Wales at the moment. And I, I know if the uh, government in Westminster pursue this agenda of um, rolling back uh, rights under the Human Rights Act, then uh, that will something, be something that will uh, take up more weight within that constitutional review. Um, there is strong support for things staying as they are with the Human Rights Act that we still have the tools within it, like judicial review to challenge public bodies. Um, and that's something that the response from Welsh Government was very clear. They don't want any change to. If there is any change, I think they would look to see what they could devolve um, to gain uh, more responsibility for within Wales, which is um, something that uh, is a, a constant area for dis discussion within Wales. This last bit of the conversation has only get, uh, gone to show quite how far we have a very English Anglo-centric government which doesn't really take the interests of the other nations of the United Kingdom seriously and that is a real I think threat uh, to the Union which a lot of Tories would really deplore. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we call it a day for the sort of um, discussion session now Toby, I know, has one or two things to say um, uh, about um, uh, the meeting and um, HSLD. 
uh, before we um, finally go offline. And so I'll hand over to, to Dobie with uh, great thanks for organising um, this meeting. Thank you, Jonathan. I, of course, I'd like to thank you and Kathy and David for participating in this event and also for Stuart as a backup for me as moderator. There was a 48 hour period during which it looked very much as if I wouldn't be able to get online at all today. Um, if anybody is interested in humanist and secularist liberal democrats and doesn't know very much about us, you're very welcome to check out our website, which is uh, www.hsld.org.uk where you can find out a lot more including how to join us uh, go on our mailing list or become a member and you can also click on the poll tab on the right hand side of your screen where you will be asked uh, if you would like to go on the mailing list and that's the easiest way to get straight onto it um, those yes if uh, if you'd like to see this event again at some point in the future it will be made available to us by the party and we will be banging it up on youtube it may take a bit of time from past experience but you should be able to relive the whole of this glorious event as many times as you wish in future and tell all of your friends about it um and uh, yes may i ask a question on my own accounts before we get thrown out i'm not sure when exactly that will be well, I, I think we've got four minutes, so yes, yes. that <laughs> um, What happens to the existing cases where judgments have been made based on the Human Rights Act as it stands, but not applied? I'm thinking particularly of humanist marriage, uh, where effectively I think it was said that uh, there, there, there needs to be equal and fair provision for non-religious marriages, but given that the government was in the process of introducing those, um, no immediate legal um, action, further action was required by the judiciary. David? Yeah, well, I mean, um, you've got a sort of um, complicated situation. I mean, humanist marriage actually has thrown up a sort of interesting processes because I think I mentioned in Scotland, it sort of came in because a single registrar agreed um, with the Strasbourg based uh, interpretation of the Scottish legislation. In Wales, the court declared that um the, the, the sorry, not in Wales in Northern Ireland the court declared that the Northern, that Northern Irish provisions were incompatible um then the Court of Appeal reversed that on the basis that they didn't need to do so because the, the law was clear anyway it got a bit messy and then um the Northern Irish um uh, uh, legislation um was was amended so each of each of those different um uh, jurisdictions in the UK has had a sort of tortuous journey on humanist marriage for some reason it's caused particular um procedural hiccups and you, you, Toby, have just illustrated the, the one that's currently playing out in England. Um, if, if um, I suppose, if the long grass into which the government is sort of gently kicking that issue <clears throat> gets you know, ever longer or ever further away or whatever, then somebody might have to reinvigorate the, the litigation. Um, um, but uh, that's the sort of messy, that's not a very satisfactory answer, is it? That's the messy consequence of the way these things, the interaction between the courts sometimes and the political process. It's, it's, I mean, it's all a lesson in the dangers of trying to fool around with a system that is um, gradual, but actually working very well. Mm. I think that's um, our overall view. Well, it's 14.14 on my computer, which means that um, we're likely to get thrown off um, within a minute. So can I just say thank you all uh, very much indeed and um, perhaps we can click our leave buttons before we are all uh, sent off the ether without uh, further recourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.